Welcome, everyone, to the 10th Annual Public Defender's Justice Summit. I'm San Francisco Public Defender Jeff Adachi, and I'm so excited to be here today. Our office has been putting on the summit, can you believe it, for the past 10 years. And we draw together attorneys, community leaders, nonprofit uh, leaders and directors, and people who are committed to reforming and improving our juvenile justice and criminal justice system. And we come together once a year to talk about the issues and, and problems that we want to solve. Now th this year is a particularly special summit because yesterday marked the 50th anniversary of the Supreme Court's decision in Gideon versus Wainwright. It's one of the most significant legal decisions in our country. On March 18, 1963, the United States Supreme Court came out with a decision that said you have a right to a lawyer. Even though it had been part of the Constitution as, part of, uh, as a Sixth Amendment for years and years, it was not recognized as a right until they said that there is an obligation by states to provide a right to a lawyer. And this never would have happened unless Clarence Earl Gideon, a drifter who had been convicted of burglarizing a pool hall in 1962, hadn't taken the time and effort to write a handwritten petition to the United States Supreme Court saying that it was wrong to deny him a lawyer. At that time, unless you were charged with a capital offense, you did not have a right to a lawyer. What that meant is that if you couldn't afford to hire an attorney, you had two choices, either to plead guilty to a charge or represent yourself. The Gideon decision changed that for felony cases and later other cases uh, brought to the Supreme Court provided the right to counsel in misdemeanor cases and other cases. But this is still a basic right that we're fighting for each and every day. There was a, a New York Times uh, article uh, yesterday and it's called The Right to Counsel, Badly Battered at 50. And it talked about what's happening around the country. And here are just a couple of examples. In Miami, public defenders handle as many as 500 felony cases a year, even though the American Bar Association says attorneys should not handle more than 150. Only 24 states have statewide public defender systems. All other states, including California, have city and county systems that pretty much rely on local funding uh, to provide public defenders. In Kentucky, get this, 68 percent of poor people accused of misdemeanors show up to their first court appearance without a lawyer. In 21 counties in Florida, 70 percent of misdemeanor defendants are pled guilty in a three-minute arraignment. Many, even after arrest, can spend months in jail. One woman spent 11 months awaiting the appointment of attorney in Mississippi. You know, this is becoming more and more evident as prosecutors raise the stakes. We've seen um, most crimes increase in terms of severity. And the result of this is that more and more cases are settling through plea bargains. And not necessarily because people are guilty, but people have no other alternative but to plead guilty because of the great exposure that they face. And of course, the competency of lawyers in death penalty cases, as you've heard, are often handled by poorly paid, inexperienced lawyers. Very rarely are new trials granted. Even here in San Francisco, we have struggled to fill three investigator positions for the last six months, and we have hundreds of cases that need the attention of an investigator. So today we're going to study the aftermath of Gideon and discuss what has to happen in order to fix it? I want to thank everyone uh, who's made uh, t today's summit possible, all of you uh, for being here. I want to thank our sponsors, Kecker and Van Ness, Morrison and Forrester, uh, and Jim Brosnahan, uh, D Douglas Young and Farella Braun and Martel, Michael Bean and the Rose Bean Galvan Law Firm, and Tim O'Brien Investigations. I'd also like to thank all of the volunteers uh, who made this possible. Uh, Tamara Apperton, Larry Roberts, Amy Bevan, uh, John Dunbar, Kathy Asada, Angela Aoyang, and everyone else uh, who uh, helped out today. 
I want to express my gratitude to the San Francisco Public Library for providing us uh, this venue, not only today, but for the past 10 years, and also uh, uh, the uh, San Francisco government uh, TV, and this is gonna be broadcast uh, throughout the year, so thank you. I want to uh, acknowledge the Bar Association of San Francisco, Julie Tron, uh, one of the coordinators is, is here. The Bar Association has been uh, our partner in, in terms of providing indigent defense uh, to poor people in San Francisco. Uh, they maintain a conflicts panel, and so in cases where the public defender is not able to provide representation, those cases are handled uh, by the private bar, and, and, they, and they do an incredible job. So thank you very much uh, for that. I wanted to acknowledge uh, Jose Varela, who is a public defender in Marin County, uh, who's also here uh, to celebrate uh, today uh, with us. So we're going to start uh, today by showing a brief video uh, that explains the Gideon decision in the far-reaching consequences that we're going to be talking about today. A turn off Route 98 in Bay Harbor, Florida is not a trip down memory lane. Memories here don't last as long as the smoke from the local paper mill. Take this empty lot. Today you'd never know it, but history was made here. The pool hall is gone and so are the people. But the principle they left is still standing. This is Clarence Earl Gideon. He wasn't much at pool, and he was almost as bad at life. He was a very unlikely constitutional hero, but you know, the cases that come to the court don't usually come from the winners in society, they come from the losers. Clarence Gideon was poor. He had been involved in the criminal justice system ever since he was a kid. He had been getting in trouble. Trouble seemed to find Gideon. Like on June 3rd, 1961, when he was arrested for a crime that amounted to pocket change. Literally. Small change had gone missing from this cigarette machine and from this jukebox. Maybe five to sixty dollars total in the Bay Harbor pool room on the edge of Panama City, Florida. That's the pool hall there on the bottom. Some wine, some beer, and a few bottles of Coca-Cola were also gone. A witness claimed he saw Gideon that night his pockets bulging with change. For the change in the stolen drinks, Gideon found himself facing some very serious time in prison. I have no counsel. Why do you not have counsel? Do you know that your case is set for trial today? Your Honor, I request this court to appoint counsel to represent me in this trial. I'm sorry, but I will have to deny your request to appoint counsel to defend you in this case. But Gideon was a stubborn old man who thought this was unfair. The United States Supreme Court says I am entitled to be represented by counsel. By asking the court to appoint a lawyer, Gideon thought he was asserting a right written into the Sixth Amendment, the right to counsel. This right is as basic as any right in the American Constitution because the threat uh, that is presented by arrest and imprisonment and sometimes even execution is as great as any threat uh, that the Constitution allows the government to have. But Clarence Earl Gideon had to defend himself because the state of Florida had denied him a lawyer. The entire trial lasted only a day and a jury found him guilty before it was time for dinner. He was sentenced to the maximum, five years in prison. For thousands of cases just like this, the story ends here, walking into prison and doing the time. But this time, Gideon went to prison convinced he didn't belong there. He still said he was innocent, and that without a lawyer, the state of Florida didn't give him a fair trial. So he did something most people would attribute to insanity or fairy tales. With a pencil and a prison notepad, Clarence Earl Gideon wrote a petition to the Supreme Court of the United States. The Supreme Court has a category of cases it calls informer pauperous cases. That means cases brought to the court by people who are too poor to pay the usual fees and too poor to print up their documents. Poor people can file just with a typewritten or even handwritten document. And Gideon's was handwritten. It was a letter on lined prison stationery. You couldn't imagine a simpler, more elementary way of getting to the highest court in the land. But why would the Supreme Court decide to hear the case of a poor man with no lawyer who was already in prison. Because the Constitution allows even the poorest citizens to be heard and to have an impact on the rest of us. Lightning strikes from the ground up. 
It may have been sparked by Gideon, but there on the court was Justice Hugo Black, ready to catch him. He was the most influential member of the Supreme Court during his time. Black felt that people should not be disadvantaged in getting justice because they are poor. As a judge, his Bible was the Constitution. We had the best Constitution in the world. And if we would follow it, it'd be all right. On the morning of March 18th, the decision was announced from the bench of the Supreme Court. Chief Justice Warren turned to Justice Black and said, like this just nodded, and Justice Black said, I have for announcement the decision and opinion of the court, Gideon against Wainwright. Here was Justice Black's vindication for 20 years of dissent from Betts against Brady. He said, we were wrong when we decided Betts against Brady, and now we're finally making it right. For Hugo Black, the vindication was complete. Not only did his belief in the 14th Amendment carry the day, but largely because of Black, the court decided in Gideon's favor, nine to nothing. The decision was unanimous. It was one of Black's greatest opinions. The day had arrived when this principle, for which he had fought for so long as a justice, was now the law of the land. The court had now truly established the principle, hanging right over its front door, equal justice under law. When the Supreme Court decided the Gideon case, they really breathe life into that phrase. And it doesn't matter if you're rich, it doesn't matter if you're poor, you get the same equal chance. Just look at what happened to Gideon. His win at the Supreme Court didn't set Gideon free, but it gave him a second trial, and this time with a competent attorney. Not guilty. So say you all, gentlemen? Yes, sir. Clarence Earl Gideon was a free man. The man who had won a landmark Supreme Court case went back to a modest and honest living, working odd jobs and pumping gas. Free, because of the principle he'd helped to establish. When I go to the United States Supreme Court and I see where it reads equal justice under law, I'm very inspired by that. I I'm very comforted by that. But I'm also provoked by that, because I know that we don't have equal justice under law. I know that even now, even after Gideon, lots of poor people are treated unfairly. I see it as an aspiration, but I don't see it as something we've realized yet. It takes more than one person to turn a principle into a common practice. But the value of that right is that it's there, written into the Constitution and established as a goal for society to reach for and to live up to. People will fall short. Rights can be ignored or even trampled, but that's why it's written down. So that even a stubborn old man in prison can protect himself with nothing more than a pencil and some knowledge. If you know your rights, you can protect your rights. If you don't know your rights, you can't. They'll always be there if we protect them, if we fight for them, if we make sure they're not taken away. And that's the essence of the Gideon story. He understood he had a right, and it was being taken away from him and he fought to get it back. If you're wondering uh, how it is that they had a televised proceeding of, of Gideon's uh, trial, they actually reenacted it um, on, uh, on television and of course uh, they had Gideon play Gideon and they had uh, the judge and the DA play themselves. Uh, so Next, I'd like to introduce uh, Chris uh, Kearney. Chris Kearney is the current president of the San Francisco Bar Association, or the Bar Association of San Francisco. He's also a litigation partner at Kecker and Van Ness, which represents accountants and lawyers in high-stakes uh, professional liability matters. They also represented a client of mine who was unjustly convicted on uh, suppressed evidence, and uh, ultimately he was freed. So I'll always be grateful uh, for your work. And uh, our Justice Summit is, is made possible uh, thanks to the help of the Bar Association of San Francisco as well as Kecker and Van Is. Please join me in welcoming Chris to the stage. Thank you, Jeff, and great to see so many people here today. As Jeff said, I'm a partner at Kecker and Van Ness, and I'm proud to be the 100th president of the Bar Association this year. And it's uh, great to be here on this particular day uh, with a great group of panelists talking about a very, very important subject. 
We're also proud as a bar association to partner with Jeff's office in representing indigent clients in cases that the public defender's office can't handle. We're very proud of that relationship and are committed to it this year and going forward. This year's fu uh, summit, focused on the 50th anniversary of the Gideon decision, is aptly named the Road to Equal Justice. Yes, the road trip that began with that stubborn old man that we just saw on the screen, and with the promise and excitement following a unanimous Supreme Court decision in 1963, has increasingly been a road trip marred by stoplights, heavy traffic, and yes, an occasional U-turn. Sunday's editorial in the New York Times was titled, Gideon's Muted Trumpet, and it cited our keynote speaker, Karen Hoppard, uh, and her book, her new book, that talks about the harsh reality of a system where public defenders have to handle hundreds of cases, even some cases she'll cite a 1,000 or 2,000 cases in the course of a year. That's a tough reality, whether it's 500 or 100 or 1,000 cases, something that Jim Brosnahan and I, who, who handle more uh, business litigation, could not imagine handling and handling well. And so that's why this anniversary and events like this are so important. They remind us why court funding and why funding of public defenders is so critical and so vital. These days, there's too much worry about the economic costs of funding a judicial system and not enough worry about the societal costs of not funding the road to equal justice. That said, there's more light been shined on this subject in recent weeks and months around the 50th anniversary of Gideon, more articles written, more gatherings like this, more than any time I can remember, and that's important. And so maybe in California, armed with a top-rate public defender, Jeff Adachi and his team, and with an enlightened AG and a like-minded DA, maybe we can be begin to make some of the societal change that's necessary, can make a dent in our nation's shameful prison industrial complex. Indeed, last fall, as you may remember, <laughs> last fall we did make some progress even at the ballot box, which has been very difficult in this generation. But Prop 36 passed, which made at least some retrenchment in a deeply embedded three strikes law. I also wanted to point out to this group, even though the focus today is on public defenders and the criminal system, in San Francisco we're trying to go even further than that, and in last year the San Francisco Board of Supervisors passed a resolution making San Francisco the very first in this nation right to civil counsel city. What we refer to as civil Gideon, and Jim Brosnahan who's here in the front row has been very, very instrumental in pushing for that, because there are civil cases eviction cases, family law cases, where the consequences, the results that follow in court are almost as severe as what Gideon faced and what uh, defendants face in criminal cases. So it's very, very important. And while we recognize at the outset that the, the supervisor's proclamation is part aspirational and part inspirational, our legal community has rallied around it. And the Bar Association and our firms have taken on more eviction cases than ever and as part of a pilot project this year. And later this year, we'll be holding an event to thank those participants and to try to build some momentum as we move forward on that related front. So please stay tuned about that. But in the meantime, let's focus on Gideon and the public defender's role. And I would say if there's ever a time and a place to turn the tide and to bring music back to Gideon's trumpet, it is here and it is now. So on behalf of the Bar Association and our sponsor firms, we thank you for your effort and focus and look forward to a great day. Thank you. About a year and a half ago, we saw one of the most dramatic shifts when the state took funding and re reallocated it to local governments and counties uh, to begin ho housing and supervising uh, state prisoners. Our next speaker, our Chief Probation Officer, Wendy Still, has been at the forefront of the reform effort, not only here in San Francisco, but statewide. And she's here to give us a, a brief update on what's happening with realignment.
Thank you, Public Defender Dachi, for inviting adult probation to be part of this important summit. I'll apologize for my voice in advance. I just recently returned from China. Well, I came back. My voice hasn't yet made it back. So um, bear with me, if you would. Uh, I'd like to spend a few minutes um, providing an update on our San Francisco's realignment efforts. I'm very proud that our criminal justice partnership in San Francisco and of the outstanding success that we've realized in transforming San Francisco's criminal justice system into one that uses science-based proven approaches to help people change their lives, which reduces recidivism and victimization and moves us closer as a county toward our goal of breaking the intergenerational cycle of incarceration. Much like Gideon transformed the nation years ago, I believe realignment has set the stage to transform our criminal justice system on a wholesale basis and a national basis. And what we're learning and experiencing in California and very specifically in San Francisco are going to help many other states and jurisdiction find a different way to serve justice and at the same time change lives and again reduce recidivism. Our county's realignment efforts really started with SB 678, which is evidence-based probation supervision, which what all that means is that we have individual treatment plans. We look at the individual and create a case plan based upon his or her needs and not taking a wholesale one-size approach, which we know about the terrible results. The state prison system recidivism rate was 78%, so we certainly couldn't do any worse with realignment, right? <laughs> and I'm really happy to report that we have proven that the sky has not fallen since realignment. In San Francisco, we have achieved amazing results, which I'll share those stats with you in just a few minutes. But important parts of um, this evidence-based approach was swift and certain sanctions, which included flash incarceration, but also positive rewards for um, positive behavior, and also something that a leader that San Francisco was, in terms of a legal approach, was ensuring that due process rights were guaranteed to those individuals that basically were subject to this new law uh, authorizing flash incarcerations. Um, Evidence-based sentencing then was the second stage of that, which what all that means is that we provided the court, the public defenders, and the district attorneys with criminogenic risk and needs information, and our recommendation was not based on a punishment model. It was based on a behavioral change model. We fast forward into realignment, and our city and county created a um, stellar partnership with the public defender's office, the district attorney office, which also implemented new approaches in terms of alternative sentence planners and expanded also some of their services, the social services that they were able to provide and really partnered as a criminal justice team with the courts and with probation to take a different approach. Um, we also, uh, as part of our approach, took over a third of the dollars that the county got and invested the money, talking about return on investment, $4 million into services. If people are going to change their lives, they need to have services that will help them change their lives. So that's been an important priority. Important other partners have been public health for mental health, substance abuse, medical, housing, human services agency um, for housing and employment, uh, office economic and workforce development, the courts, police, the sheriff. We also have went into the prisons probation and started the reentry planning and also our many um, CBO partners. Now talking about the results, which proves if you, if you change your approach, then you can improve the results. And in San Francisco, three years ago, before realignment and evidence-based probation and sentencing, we had over 7,000 individuals on probation. As a result of these different approaches, we now currently have 5,500 individuals under supervision. And that includes all of this population that has been realigned from the state, which is over 700 individuals. <laughs> Um, and instead of a 78% failure rate, which is what parole has, probation has a 77% success rate, again, changing the focus. Um, the number of felony probationers who were revoked and sent to state prison 
three years ago, well, actually a little over that, four, was 75% in 2009. And in 2012, again, reducing by 75%, we sent 65 individuals. Of the 1,310 felony probationers, we talked about that, 77% completed successfully. And of this new realigned population, 65% of those PRCS and mandatory supervision clients, those are the ones that basically had had 78% failure rates. 65% have been in total compliance, no new law violation. And 55% have had no arrest or sanctions, including violations or flash incarceration. And 87% of these individuals are reporting to probation for services. And we have a, a lot more plans in the work. We're opening a community assessment and service center, a one-stop for these individuals that need assistance. But I think really what San Francisco has done is continued to be a leader, you know, with the outstanding just uh, public defender and the district attorney's office and the partnership with probation. We've really proved that we can achieve justice in success, but at the same time save and change lives. And so I'm very thankful to be part of the Criminal Justice Partnership in San Francisco. It's an honor, and we're not only leading the way in California, but we're leading the way in the nation to change its approach to serving justice. So thank you for allowing me to be here. Next, it's my great honor to introduce Supervisor Malia Cohen, uh, who is here, to present a proclamation uh, to, to us. Supervisor Malia Cohen uh, represents uh, District 10, which includes uh, Bayview Hunters Point and Sunnydale. Hey, everyone. Good morning. How are all my justice fighters doing out there? You feeling strong? <laughs> today's, today's day is supposed to invigorate and, and enliven you and strengthen our, our commitment to, bring, to ensure that we have social justice and justice everywhere. So not only do I represent Bayview, but I also represent Petrero Hill and Visitation, and Visitation Valley. Um, and it has absolutely been a gift being able to serve um, not only San Francisco, my hometown, but specifically the southeastern neighborhoods. So today I really want to share with you in the celebration and the recognition of uh, the 50th anniversary. And uh, Jeff, I'm going to ask that you kind of come up here, right here, and uh, in front of everybody, in front of all of our partners, just look out. I mean, this is, this is amazing, everyone. But today is March 18th, 2013, and today marks the 50th anniversary of Gideon v. Rain Wainwright, the United States Supreme Court decision that provided that a poor person accused of a crime is entitled to a public defender at no cost. What a novel idea. Whereas public defenders, law enforcement, legal experts, journalists, and concerned citizens will gather at the San Francisco Public Defender's 2013 Justice Summit on March 19th to discuss ways to better fulfill Gideon's promise of justice for all. Whereas Clarence Earl Gideon, convicted of burglarizing a Florida pool hall after being forced to defend himself at trial, began a David versus Goliath fight when, we, when he wrote a petition to the Supreme Court from his jail cell arguing that his rights had been violated. Whereas Clarence Earl Gideon's victory represented a victory for the poor, for civil rights, and for justice. Whereas San Francisco has the distinction of being one of the first cities in the United States to establish and publicly fund a public defender's office opening its doors in 1921. Whereas Gideon's promise lives on through the San Francisco Public Defender's Office, which serves 25,000 indigent people every year. Whereas citizens of San Francisco join with the public defenders and the legal aid lawyers all across the country to celebrate the right to counsel. Therefore, be it resolved that San Francisco Board of Supervisors hereby proclaims March 18, 2013 as Gideon versus Wayne White Day in San Francisco County as acknowledgement for the 50 years since the unanimous United States Supreme Court landmark decision and the work of the public defenders who continue to fulfill the constitutional promise of the Bill of Rights.
Thank you very much, uh, Supervisor Cohen. I'd like to thank the other members of the Board of Supervisors and the Mayor for their support as well. I want to share this uh, with uh, Public Defender uh, Ken Taniguchi, who's here from Fresno. Can you please stand and take a bow, as well as Jose Varela from the Marin Public Defender's Office. Oh, yeah, I'm sorry. And it's Wally O'Neill from uh, Santa Clara Public Defenders. Please stand and take a bow. Very honored to have you here. Congratulations. You're recently appointed.